This message comes from NPR sponsor Neutral, offering organic, pasture-raised milk that is carbon neutral certified. Every carton of Neutral milk supports carbon reduction projects on family farms across the country. Find Neutral at Whole Foods, Sprouts, and other natural retailers. Hey, hey, I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's going on in our culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. And a warning for listeners, this episode contains some vulgar language and mentions of sex and sexuality. There's something very special happening this week. It's not on TV or in theaters, but in the animal kingdom. And one of my producers, Liam McBain, has been obsessed with it. Brittany, I've waited patiently all year just to witness this. This week is my Super Bowl. It's Fat Bear Week. It's a yearly competition put on by the Katmai National Park in Alaska to celebrate the bears getting really, really fat ahead of hibernation. And every year I watch the live stream cams from home, it's literally just bears eating salmon and sitting in a bubbling river like it's their own personal jacuzzi. Like, it rules. I will admit, when Liam first told me about this, I wasn't sold on it. But once I started checking out the live stream and seeing what the bears get up to, I kind of got into it. And the more we started talking about it, we realized bears are kind of everywhere in human culture. Think about it. We cuddle them as kids. They're in so many of our fairy tales. And we project so much more onto their furry faces. Are they our friends? With a few good friends and a stick or two, we can build... Our foes? Or, for the gay community, an icon of freedom? I felt like that was the only community that understood me. So this Fat Bear Week, we wanted to know, why are we as humans obsessed with bears? And what does that obsession say about us? So gather ye round. A tale of Brittany, that's me, and the three bears. First, we begin with real Alaskan bears and how they actually live and hang out at Katmai National Park. Liam, you are an annual voter in this contest. I sure am. And you talk to someone there on the ground. Yes, I talked to media ranger Naomi Boak. She zoomed me literally in front of the most gorgeous river. Mm. Two-time Fat Bear Week champion. He was just behind me in the lower river. It's too bad. You just missed him. She said this year, there are a lot of big, good-looking bears. I really shouldn't give you favorites because I don't want to influence the vote. But I can tell you, 128 Grazer, who may be the best angler on the river, she's had two litters, and she is fierce. She looks great. I feel like it's kind of sick to celebrate their fatness in such an uncomplicated way. And these big dudes have a lot of other people celebrating that, too. In 2018, the year before I got here, there were 55,000 votes for Fat Bear Week. Last year, there were over a million votes. I watch these bears so much because they seem like they're just chilling, and I love their contemplative vibes. But I learned from Naomi that they're actually working really hard to survive. It's, for some bears, more difficult to get fat. So we're rooting for them. And we're also rooting for the cubs, because the cubs are so cute. But survival rate for cubs is not great. It can be 35% for cubs in their first year. So Fat Bear Week, it's rooting for the bears and celebrating the success of this ecosystem. And while life can still be rough for bears, American bears are doing better now than they have been in years. Bear populations have increased, thanks to conservation efforts, and they're expanding their range. They're popping up in places they haven't roamed in centuries, and we're noticing. So as we're living more and more alongside one another, we don't all have to be bear super fans like Liam, but we all should be thinking more about our relationship to them. Up next, unpacking the dense symbolism of the bear. Stick around. The following message comes from NPR sponsor Sattva. Founder and CEO Ron Rudson is proud that each Sattva mattress is made to order. Your mattress has a birth date after you order it. Nothing sits in muggy warehouses. Nothing sits in muggy basements of stores. When you order it, you're getting your product made fresh for you, and people love that. 
To learn more, go to SAATVA.com slash NPR. This message comes from Apple Card. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. A high-yield, low-effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. This message comes from NPR sponsor Neutral. Neutral offers organic, pasture-raised milk that is carbon neutral certified. They're on a mission to reduce the carbon footprint of agriculture by partnering with family farms across the country to implement carbon reduction projects. To learn more about how Neutral makes carbon neutral certified milk a reality, not by 2030 or 2050, but today, visit eatneutral.com or find Neutral Milk nationwide at Whole Foods Market, Sprouts, and other natural retailers. Up First achieves the rare one-two punches of being short and thorough, national and international, fact-based and personable. Every morning, we take the three biggest stories of the day and explain why they matter. And we do it all in less than 15 minutes. So you can start your day a little more in the know than when you went to sleep. Listen now to the Up First podcast from NPR. A few months ago, a video of a bear went viral. You might have seen it. It was a sun bear standing upright at the Hangzhou Zoo in eastern China. It wasn't doing anything weird, literally just standing there. But the video reached millions of people for one reason. Some people, for a little while myself, thought the bear was so human-like that it must have been a person in a bear costume. Now, it was a bear and not a person. But I saw this video and I can kind of see it. If that person in a costume had no butt and short little legs, maybe. But this phenomenon, looking at a bear and seeing humanness reflected back at us, is definitely not new. Here's Gloria Dickey, author of the book, Eight Bears. If we go back to like the Aristotle time, Pliny the Elder, you know, they would look at bears and they would think, yes, like one of our closest relatives. And it's like even you know, thousands of years ago, we thought they could be human. And even today, we're like getting confused of how bears look so similar to us. In part because of their anatomy. Bears can walk on two legs or two feet. They're known as occasional bipeds. Uh, Not too many animals can do that, so it does give them kind of like that human stature for brief moments of time. But it's also because of how they behave. Here's bear biologist Sarah Elmaligi. When you spend a lot of time watching bears just being bears, you start to see their different personalities and how one bear might react to something very differently from how another bear would. Bears are a statistical nightmare because even the same bear is not the same bear from year to year because it's learned things. And while Sarah's focused on bear science for most of her career, she spent a lot of time thinking about what they mean to us. I sat down with Sarah to discuss just what about bears captures our imagination and how they're tied to our culture. Sarah, welcome to It's Been a Minute. I'm really happy to be here. We're so happy to have you and so excited to talk about your area of expertise today. I love bears. (laughs) I mean, I hope you do because (laughs) you've dedicated a lot of time and energy to them. I have. In thinking about that, there's a long history of humans identifying with bears. Many cultures, you know, thought they were our closest animal relatives, the, the way that we might think about primates now. Is there something about bears that captures human imagination? Oh, there definitely is. I mean, they are a very charismatic group of animals. When you watch bears, they have a lot of facial expressions and they're quite expressive in their eyes and eyebrows and ears. And it's not my place to talk about the indigenous relationship with bears, but There's like a very deep underlying respectful relationship between indigenous people and bears. Mm. And then when colonizers came to North America, bears were really seen as a symbol of the wilderness that needed to be tamed. And so Mm. that more aggressive, conflicting relationship with bears really started, you know, when people were trying to establish homesteads and it really came from this wanting to establish dominance over wilderness as we began to settle out west like that's why there are no brown bears in california anymore right like Hmm. wow as we settled out west we kind of 
killed them all. Also, like I, I think about how the big bears have also factored into like even European cultures, like Roman and Viking cultures. It seems like where there were bears to be found, humans attached strong meaning to them, whether that was because they felt a kinship or a respect, or in the case of what you're describing, like with colonization, they felt a fear. Yeah. <laughs> they saw bears as like a formidable opponent. I want to turn now to, to bears in pop culture. You have your cuddly bears, you know, yeah. like many of us. I mean, I was I was sent home from the hospital when I was a baby with a teddy bear. Yeah, of course you were. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I ha- and I slept with it every night for like the first, I don't know, eight, nine years of my life. You think about Winnie the Pooh. Bears love honey and I'm a poo bear. Yum. Paddington bear. And just one sandwich contains all the vitamins and minerals a bear needs for the whole day. You've also got park ranger bears that like right. have some kind of authority like Yogi Bear. Yogi Bear is smarter than the average bear. Smokey the Bear. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. And then you also got like your man-killing bears. Yeah. In movies like Cocaine Bear. <laughs> and The, the Revenant. Revenant. <laughs> I feel like other animals only have kind of like one quote unquote personality or mm. one archetype for their entire species. But you could see a bear as a killer and you could see a bear as a friend. How is that? Yeah, I mean that's a really that's a really insightful question and I do think that some of it might stem from the fact that like bear cubs are ridiculously cute. Like, oh my gosh, they are insane. They're so cute and fluffy and fuzzy. And they're just like these little bumbling fluff balls, like wandering through the forest. But then the flip side of that, of course, is that there are occasions where bears attack people and tragically kill people. And so there is this other side of their personality that is quite violent towards people if the right circumstances are at play. The reality is that bears are individual and some bears are more aggressive than others and some bears are, you know, more chill. So, I mean, cocaine bear is, it's very hard to watch those movies when you're a bear biologist. Like, you're just like, oh my God, I can't do this. Is anthropomorphizing bears to a certain degree helpful or harmful to them and us in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, that is a pretty continual debate, I think, in the bear world. And when I go to bear conferences, we we talk about that a lot. I think sometimes it can be helpful, but it can also be damaging because you might make assumptions that that you don't know because you're not studying bears all the time. Like assuming they're all friendly or something. Sure. Right. But then there's the other conversation of like, how do we generate public awareness and get the public interested in bears so that they want to conserve them? In North America, we have growing human populations and all of those growing human populations are putting increasing pressures on all kinds of wildlife bears included. And so if we can anthropomorphize bears a little bit in our public communication so that people understand how important it is to give bears space and to respect them and to allow them access to important habitats, then bears and people win, right? But it is this very, um, it's very difficult. It's hard for some scientists to talk about bears in that way. Hmm. What about bears? Or what we believe about bears. Do we as humans covet? Well, I think that bears are still a symbol of untamed wilderness in a lot of people's minds. And Hmm. we like to think that there are parts of the planet that haven't been touched by man. And it's not true, by the way. We have pretty much been everywhere now. But they're like the top of the food chain. So they just wander around and do what they want. I think we do covet that. That's true. As human beings, there's lots of animals that we have dominion over, you know, but bears are not quite there in that regard. I mean, a lot of times we do, like 99.9% of the time, but every once in a while, we are reminded that we actually don't control bears. Sarah, it's been such a joy talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I have thoroughly enjoyed this, Brittany. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to bear biologist Sarah Almaliki. Coming up, we just talked about how we see humanness in bears. But what about bearness in humans? Stay with us. 
This message comes from NPR sponsor Carvana. Carvana has made financing your next vehicle as smooth as can be. You can get pre-qualified in just two minutes, and you'll have real terms personalized just for you. Visit Carvana.com to get pre-qualified today. Here at Planet Money, we bring complex economic ideas down to earth. We find weird, fun, interesting stories that explain the way money shapes our lives. Inflation, recessions, the price of gas, we've got you. Listen now to the Planet Money podcast from NPR. Listening to the news can feel like a journey. The 1A podcast is here to guide you beyond the headlines and to cut through the noise. Listen to 1A, where we celebrate your freedom to listen by getting to the heart of the story together. Only from NPR. Rough Translation is a podcast with stories from people around the world that give us a new lens on our own life. Like, what can a Japanese elementary school teach us about hands-off parenting? Or a trip to Ukraine about the art of resilience? And can a luxurious French lunch break, two hours, really help us get our work done? Rough Translation from NPR. Let us take you places. As we just heard, bears hold a lot of symbolism in our culture. And while for centuries we looked at them and saw humanness, there's also a subculture of humans that emulates bearness. I'm talking about gay bears. For those who don't know what a gay bear is, well, it means different things to different people. But stereotypically, it means a cis gay man who's heavier and hairier than others. I'm not going to kind of like sign my name in blood and be like, this is what I think a bear is, right? Because I think there are loads of variations. But I think the kind of huskiness, furriness, this heavy set, manly appearance, but which also is kind of cuddly at the same time. That's Gareth Longstaff, senior lecturer at Newcastle University who researches queer theory and cultural heritage. He says there's been a shift away from this definition, though to one that includes gay trans men and people with various gender expressions as well. Trans men are using their spaces and finding them as kind of affirming spaces. Increasingly, you will get lesbian bears, Mm -hmm. but bear culture has its genesis in very much white cisgendered gay male culture. He says it's not a perfectly inclusive culture, but at its best, it's playful, sexy, and often celebrates bigger bodies. Gareth says he sees a lot of potential in the bear. I sat down with him to talk more about how identifying with the bear can change how we see masculinities. Gareth, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, so first question. What was the first time you went to a bear event and what was your immediate reaction? Oh, wow. Um, 20 years ago. There was a very popular club called XXL. I mean, it's a perfect name, yeah. I can remember having like long conversations in XXL at the time because it used to kind of show on big screens things like the Golden Girls. So you would be like with all (laughs) these really heavy set big guys, right? With loads of tattoos and loads of hair and shaven heads and tight t-shirts dancing to like (laughs) high energy dance music. And then there'd be like Golden Girls episodes on. (laughs) And I love that very queer mix of things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that to me was kind of like, oh my God, I've come home. This is like everything (laughs) I've always wanted. But that, (laughs) that to me is one of the kind of like the paradoxes of kind of like virile and potent masculinity happening in that space. And then the opportunities within bear culture for a much more camp, playful, self-conscious way of kind of understanding and knowing one another. So gay bears have been around for a while, both as an identity and a culture, and they started to really take off around 50 years ago. What need did it fill? I think that bear culture as an emergent culture, like from the 70s onward, is almost like this very smart at times funny, subversive, transgressive way of actually taking an already existing straight male culture and kind of queer in it. You get this constructed manliness, but done so in a kind of playful way. So I think you can take those things which arouse you socially, sexually, personally, and work with them and rework with them. And I think that's a very queer way of doing something. So the gay bear, in a way, subverts existing forms of masculinity, which forces you to kind of see masculinities and the plural, not just masculinity. Hmm. I definitely see that part of it, where there's this refashioning of traditional masculinity to make 
a new exploration of masculinity or creating a new tentacle or a new masculinity itself. There's something there about the body as well when I'm thinking about yeah. what need that bear culture might fulfill. Like I've heard from gay men in my life that there's a lot of gatekeeping in let's say like more mainstream non-bear gay spaces based on body type. So being, you know, very yeah. specifically muscled or having a certain percentage yeah. of body fat or being thin, if that's not your body, then you can be excluded implicitly Completely. and in many cases explicitly. I mean, gay male culture, it's as inclusionary as it's exclusionary in the same breath. Hmm. Bear culture, I think, begins to kind of tear up the rule book slightly and say, well, actually, if your body type is not like a perfect, you know, cover of a gay male magazine or a pop star, then there's space for you here. There are no rules here in terms of like having a big belly or, you know, being 60 years of age as opposed to being 17 years of age. Mm. I find wonderfully exciting. But alongside of that as well, it also comes with its own parameters that you kind of need the hairy body, you need the mustache, you need the beard, you mm. kind of need to be a bit bigger. So it's a bit of a catch-22 sometimes where you're kind of like, well, it's offering me up a space where I can be who I want. However, if my body type becomes too muscular or too slender and, you know, I lose a bit of my belly or my hairiness on my chest goes, then does that mm. exclude me more? So it's kind of like always a paradox, but I do think for all of its kind of challenges, I do think that the bear community allows anyone to question accepted norms. We've talked about like how there's so many different shades to bear identity, but still when it comes down to it, there is a very strong identification of gay bears with bears the animal. How does the bear, the animal, work as a symbol? For me, there is a kind of like, with a bear, a sort of strength, potency, kind of virility, roughness, which is also undercut by its kind of cuddliness, its reliability, its comforting kind of quality in nature. And Again, I was thinking about this, you know, the bearing culture has so many variations. I think more specifically, though, in relation to kind of like the gay bear and the anthropomorphism, I think that it really feeds into that. And like, if you're rugged and cuddly, then you're a gay bear. That's the kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. If I think of how we engage, and everybody does this differently, but if you think of the kind of sexual element to the bear, mm -hmm. I've even seen guys, right? And it's a very big thing in like bear culture, if you go to a club night, often guys will end up with like their tops off. They'll be wearing harnesses, mm -hmm. dancing together and like hitting each other's chests yeah. or like holding each other like that. And like really like animalistically like kissing each other. But then there's a gentleness to it as well. Like when they move away, it might be like, oh, do you want a drink? Or, you know, that. so it's quite performative in some ways. That kind of idea of something which is intense and virile and aggressive and rugged. And then afterwards, you know, maybe after the kind of sex has taken place, mm -hmm. kind of gentle and cuddly and respectful, it kind of does lean back into, you know, the bear as an animal. I wonder, you described this sort of like camped up, refashioned, more playful masculinity. How does the symbol of the bear or does the symbol of the bear help separate those masculinities? Yeah, I think like that symbol somehow kind of grounds or connects bears together. And um, the bear paw is used quite a lot in gay male culture. Hmm. I talk about ecologist Timothy Treadwell. This is the guy from the Grizzly Man film, right? That's who you're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. Go exactly, ahead. exactly. Yeah. So you know the guy, right? So this is the guy that basically lives with grizzly bears, right? Very, 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 very crudely yeah. speaking, well, right? Yeah. I can't remember the author specifically, but I think it's Colin Carman. Um, he talks about, he calls it grisly love. This is kind of to do with a move away from our obsession with each other as humans and trying to understand through, through re-engaging with things like animals and nature, who we are, you know, I think Carmen calls it like becoming animal to actually like give your humanity up to a kind of animalistic form of becoming is an incredibly like liberating, but also very difficult project to undertake because it involves giving up 
everything that is normal to then go towards this very queer space of human becoming animal. Mm. And I think that there's something here with bear culture that kind of connects to that, this figure of the bear, which we can then kind of like assimilate as gay masculinity. It's kind of like an extreme or abstracted way Mm. of moving beyond our own humanness towards something which is kind of animal-like. So without the bear, I don't think bear culture would be the same culture that it is now. Gareth, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you today. This has been so much fun and I've learned so much. Oh, thank you. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Brittany. While Gareth sees opportunity for expansiveness, we need to take a moment to acknowledge that the bear community isn't all-inclusive just yet. Take party organizer Will mckinney Raffelt who, at first, says finding bear culture connected him with the bigger men he was into. It's like a kid in a candy store, truly. It's like, oh my God. And while he felt welcome as a thick guy, as a Black man, he didn't always feel included. So I have been in and out of the bear community since around 2008, 2009. As I started to talk to more bears of color, it's like, hmm, this community is not as inclusive as it seems on the surface, Even down to like the advertising and things like that, up until recently, nine times out of ten, majority of the men that would be on the flyers are always white. But Will and his friends decided to do something about it. They created their own party for queer black and brown men of size in New York called Heft. We created it as a means to give space for particularly big boys of color to dance to the music that we know and love which is basically Mm. shake that ass music. Straight up juvenile, city girls, Megan Thee Stallion, (laughs) all of that. So either the first or the second one was when we really knew that we were onto something special. Everyone just loving the music so much, throwing that ass back and just going crazy on the dance floor. And while Heft aims to be a different kind of party for big guys, there's still one constant we'll seize. No matter where you go to a bear party, there's always going to be somebody that wants to take the shirt off. I mean, obviously, big guys get hot, they're dancing, they're sweaty, you know, they just want to take the shirt off. We project a lot onto bears, for better or for worse, but we project even more onto each other. And one of the things I keep coming back to as we've gone on this bear journey is that with all of the constraints of being a human, it's kind of freeing to look to the bear and remember that we're animals too. There's something elemental about ripping your shirt off on the dance floor, forgetting your self-consciousness and moving with the music, or sitting in a stream, knocking back salmon and vibing. While we know now they're not our closest relatives, bears are still a mirror that show us who we are and who we want to be. Thanks again to all the people you heard in this episode. Producer Liam McBain, Ranger Naomi Boak, author Gloria Dickey, bear biologist Sarah Almaligi, lecturer Gareth Longstaff, and party organizer Will mckinney Raffelt. And for the Bear Curious, you can find the Fat Bear Week brackets at fatbearweek.org. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hi, Brittany. This is Garrett Reiner calling from Savannah, Georgia. I was just trying to talk a little bit about the new Drake album for all the dogs. I'm bringing it up because I am 35 years old and I have spent the last 10 summers dancing to a hot new Drake single. I just want to say he's in the zeitgeist. He's being talked about and in the words of Drake... Even though there's haters behind closed doors, there's a lot of six god worshiping. Thanks for taking the call. Love the show. Garrett from Savannah, thank you so much for calling in. I always wanted to go to Savannah. I hear the food and the views are amazing. But to get to the topic at hand, Drake has been on my mind for admittedly the last 20 years. I was a big Degrassi The Next Generation viewer. I had a big crush on Jimmy, the character that Drake played on there. And I mean, it's been really interesting to see how he's changed his image as a rapper from like the lover boy who was so different from everybody else in the late 2000s to now here we are 2023. First of all, his new album is called For All the Dogs. 
So I'm assuming he means dogs as in trash, raggedy men, which is the only people he seems to be rapping to these days. I think you all will recall last week when Drake at a concert was talking to some butthurt young guy who was upset over this woman who had rejected him. And Drake said some curse word around this young woman and then said he'd give this guy $50,000. Like, if that's not stepping to the dark side, I don't know what it is. Look, I could see how maybe that's like a rebrand that he felt was something that he needed to do to mature his image now that he's in his late 30s. But some of the stuff he's saying on For All the Dog is just like, even if the beat is good, what are you talking about and who are you talking to? For example, on a recent single, a song that he put out with SZA called Slime You Out, Drake says, I don't know what's wrong with you girls. I feel like y'all don't need love. You need somebody who could micromanage you, you know what I'm saying? Tell you right from wrong, who's smart from who's a fool, what you tend to use for which food, like. Drake. I'm sorry. I don't need anybody that can micromanage me. He is now specifically talking to college age guys under 25 who can believe the fairy tales and fantasies that he's selling with this new album. One day they're going to be 31, 32, 33. They're going to have mortgages and partners and kids. And all the things that Drake is talking about now are going to seem like a faint, distant memory of a sillier time. And then what is he going to do? It's kind of hard to come back from being the villain in this way. We'll see how that works out for Drake. Garrett, thank you so much for calling in with this question. I have had a really interesting morning listening to this Drake album and trying to figure out, like I said, who the heck he thinks he's talking to. It certainly ain't me. Anyway, you have a great weekend and avoid the dogs. If you have a thought or question about pop culture, send us a voice memo at ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. Our editor is Jessica Plachek. Bilal Qureshi. Engineering support came from Hannah Glovna. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of Programming is Yolanda Sanguini. Our senior VP of Programming is Anya Grundman. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. Science is not just for the PhDs of the world. It's for everyone. On the Shortwave podcast, we dig into the latest news with a humorous touch, all in under 15 minutes. We might not take ourselves seriously, but we take science very seriously. Listen now to the Shortwave podcast from NPR. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has dominated world news since it began in February of 2022. In the State of Ukraine podcast, we haven't let up our coverage. NPR's journalists give you the latest, bringing you stories from the ground and discussing what each new development means for the rest of the world. Listen to the State of Ukraine podcast from NPR.